Back in the gun with another episode of Phil Stew. He's going to break down some of the best games in the top 25, along with some of the Big 12. We'll also get his thoughts on that West Virginia-Kansas Big 12 opener here right after the break. You are now watching Believe. I-T-G. With special guest, Phil Stew. Author of the College Football Bible. Bible. You can see things before they happen. Well, I definitely like West Virginia's offensive line. All you got to do is bet on the winner and you'll never lose. I like the Mountaineers to win this one. Taylor, touchdown! To me, the key matchup here is that West Virginia run game. Hey, a real pleasure being on. Thanks for having me on the In the Gun podcast. Because once you enter this family, it's no good now. In the Gun, episode 194. It's another edition of Phil Steel Friday here on ITG. I'm Skylar Callan. That is Jed, the signal caller, Drenning. And uh, we'll get to some of our picks from last week as West Virginia took down Kansas in the Big 12 opener, 32-28. to 28, Thrilling fashion. Probably shaved a few years off of some folks' lives after the last couple of weeks. But this is a good time for the bye week. We'll get into our picks here in just a second. And as always, this episode of ITG is brought to you in part by Bet Online. Bet Online is your number one source for all your betting needs. Bet Online, where the game starts. And also, shout out to our friends at Toothman Ford and all the great work that they do there and with the Mountaineers as well. Toothman Ford, we all know cars cost less in Grafton. So, Jed, go and give us a recap of our picks last week. I think the week before, I went three for four. The week before that, I, I didn't do too swell. So, hopefully, uh, not too bad here in week four. Bear with me as I battle through this with my voice. I sound like an 80s DJ that my wife listens to <laughs> all the time. A pack and a half a day for 30 years. Uh, but, uh, okay, last week our prop bets versus Kansas. We had a prop bet on T.J. Crandall, West Virginia quarterback, T.J. cornerback, T.J. Crandall, over under 28 and a half snaps. We knew he was going to play significantly. Uh, caveat to this, you picked yeah. over, I picked under. He got hurt. At 27 snaps. Oh. So he ended up under right before he hit the over. I call BS. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, th- there's like, these are interesting. We impacted some crucial parts of the game with these picks. Maybe we got some voodoo going. Uh, and then we looked at sacks. Kansas was very difficult to sack. West Virginia's pass rush starting to come around. We went over under on West Virginia's sacks by the defense, one and a half. You picked over, I picked under. The answer was two. You hit that one. Uh, and then we talked about Kansas punter Damon Greaves of the second lowest hang time in the Big 12. We thought we were going to have some opportunities for returns. And we asked quite simply, Preston Fox's longest return of the year was 14 yards. Will P. Fox have a new long? Well, P. Fox didn't, <laughs> but Rodney Gallagher did. Rodney Gallagher yep. had a 16-yard return. So I guess we were both right and wrong because we both picked the yes. We will have a new season high or season long in punt returns. The punt return unit did it, but it wasn't P. Fox. And P. Fox came in after the weather delay to field those uh, fair catches. So, and then moving down to the quarterback run game, quite simply, which quarterback will run for more yards, Jalen Daniels or Garrett? You picked Jalen. I picked Garrett. Gigi ran for 87. Jalen went for 11. So I hit that one. But uh, these were some tricky ones because of some of the yeah. personnel that was in and out, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I heard – first heard word about Preston on Thursday. It may have been either right before the coach's show or during the coach's show about his availability. He's like, well, there goes the one bet for me. And uh, But if you would have told me that they would have held Jalen Daniels to that much rushing yards or that few of rushing yards, I would have really liked our chances going into it. But interesting game. You give up over 200 yards on the ground, but you found some ways to kind of keep the ball in front of you through the air. And, and like you guys talked about you know, earlier in the week too, when, when you're playing a team like that, you kind of have to pick your poison. And they, they just kind of dared them to run the football, which is kind of a little scary considering that's what they do. But – you were getting so you were getting beat badly in the passing game. You had to help out your secondary. So and it's uh, so ironic that you found you found Kansas 
in such a similar situation with a th- facing that third down that West Virginia was at Pittsburgh. Yeah. In other words, Kansas so <laughs> desperately needed to get a couple first downs, and it came down to a third and four. And a lot of people question, well, why did Kansas do what they did on that third and four? Well, when, when you study that play and scrutinize it, a couple things are very obvious. Kansas called something to start with. From the time they broke the huddle, Jalen Daniels was – his eyes were transfixed on the sidelines. Yeah. And so we came out in cover zero with a five-man front, eight men in or around the box. And I, I'm pretty certain, Skyler, they had the speed option call on. That would be my guess because here's the thing. Jalen Daniels had yet to throw a pass since the weather delay started or it yeah. lifted. He didn't throw a pass. That's true. I mean, up to that point in the game, he hadn't thrown the football once since the weather delay was lifted. Their their touchdown drive was all running plays. So did you really feel comfortable putting it in the air with Jalen Daniels? Probably not since he hadn't thrown the ball in so long in real time. Now, you had had success recently with that speed option. A matter of fact, three of Kansas's 10 previous plays, they ran it for 6, 12, and 6. I'm pretty sure they had that call on, and they planned on running that. But what happened was they lined up and came out of the huddle, and Daniels was looking at the sidelines, and West Virginia comes out in this cover zero look with a heavy box, and they only had the five offensive linemen and one tight end in the game. There was a time earlier in the game they had two tights, and they had a seven-on-eight look, which is different against the option because then you can option one of those defenders. But we had an eight-on-six box into a, you know in our favor. So Kansas checked out of whatever the original call was, and I'm convinced it was speed option. But what do you check into? You check into Jeff Grimes' bread and butter, which is outside zone. And his thinking most likely was, well, yeah, the box is eight to six in your favor. But when I run outside zone, just by the nature in which we block it, some of those defenders have a chance to get washed up yeah. more so than in a conventional gap scheme. So uh, that's what I think was happening. But West Virginia – with those eight defenders in the box, uh, got push, made plays, had penetration. You held the edge. You had a combination of Sean Martin, Tyron Bradley. I mean, there were a lot of players making plays. And then we talked about the fact that you saw Josiah Trotter react so quickly to help contain. And, uh, I mean, it was a cat and mouse game all day of when we were playing some of that nickel look uh, earlier in the game, we had Aiden Garns at nickel. They would bounce in and out of things, considering him a soft edge against the run. But in this particular instance, here we come with an eight-man box, and we forced them to check out of whatever it was they initially called into the outside zone, and we made plays. We we literally, at the point of attack, when you watch it on tape, we dominated at the point of attack on that outside zone. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say Kansas truly won a single block on that play. So – We held contain. We pushed it back into our help. And the next thing you know, it's a TFL, and they're punting the football. So that was a critical, critical situation for the West Virginia defense. Great stop. Yeah, I mean, massive win. And and I know we can all sit there and and kind of dwell on on the backyard brawl. And and, and in a lot of ways, I mean, that that kind of makes the difference in the feeling going into the bye week. If you don't blow that game, you're feeling so much better about how things are right now at three and one versus two and two, and you don't have that game. But you like the resiliency of this team. They could have just mailed it in down eleven with four or five minutes to go and and, and lost all confidence. And they didn't. Their backs were against the wall. They kept fighting, they kept scrapping, and they found a way to come back and win that game. Uh, to get the two and two on the season, back to 500, one and zero in league play, the games that really t- truly matter. So great start to there's, league play. There's some uh, things to in the this league. front seven scholar to get excited about a build around. I mean, TJ Jackson through four games has been such an, a model of consistency. Twenty pressures. He actually <laughs> leads the nation in in uh, pass quarterback pressures. Yeah, he's the only guy that really showed up in that respect against Penn State. But Tyron Bradley is coming around, Mm -hmm. and he has a chance to be pretty special. I mean, he is a very underrated asset for us in that that front seven as well. Tyron Bradley is a smart, athletic football player. And for a guy that pushes 260 pounds, the things that he can do, 
he's a weapon. Yeah. And when you look at what some of those guys are doing across that defensive line, some of those young guys coming into the room, the football that Sean Martin's playing, Fatour Mamalba played a great game against Kansas. So if that defensive line in front seven continues to take steps, you have a much better chance to solve the issues on the back end with their help. Absolutely. Yeah, T.J. Jackson, like you said, 20 pressures on 99 pass snaps this season. I mean, he didn't even start the first two games of the year. So just to put that in perspective, he has been elite, maybe on pace to be the Big 12 newcomer of the year at this point, and maybe even more. So we're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll have Phil Steele. Before we do, one more uh, thank you to Fortis for roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Be sure to visit fortis.us.com. Hang tight. We'll have Phil Steele on the other side. You are in the gun. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyd's of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations, with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. Nobody supports the blue and gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never over MSRP campaign on new Fords guarantee to, to save you thousands. thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, we're car cost less in Grafton and at toothpinfor.com. All right, and we are back in the gun for Phil Steele Friday. He's going to talk some top 25, big 12 action. We'll get his thoughts at the end of the show or the end of this segment on West Virginia's win over Kansas. Phil, welcome back for another episode and uh, go ahead and promote anything you want at this time. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, up right now at philsteel.com, you can go take the Phil Steele Plus Tour with selections. Big week this week. You got six selections. Five quick hitters, and I even guarantee the quick hitters, they have to have a winning week or you get my NFL press box, a $20 value free, and it's all free. Just go to philsteel.com, take the Phil Steel Plus Tour right now and get yourself some free winners for the weekend. Another winning week last week for the selections. You know, let's start with the top 25. Uh, we're going to start with a, a Louisville at Notre Dame game, and this Louisville team is curious to me insofar as they're 15th in the country. And I don't remember the last time that I've heard so little about the 15th ranked team in the country. They're they're kind of a sneaky three and zero. Oh. Meanwhile, Notre Dame's three and one, and you would almost think they have to run the table after that Northern Illinois loss to have a crack to get into the playoffs. What what do you see happening here? Yeah, well, I, I definitely like Notre Dame in this one. Uh, if you watch the Louisville Georgia Tech game last week, uh, Georgia Tech actually outplayed them. Uh, if you go to the second half. Georgia Tech had the ball like uh, the majority of the second half. They had first and goal at the one yard line, didn't score. Uh, they get down, and once again, they're they're only down by uh, five points or something. And they they go to kick a field goal. It's blocked and returned for a touchdown in the first half. Uh, they had a, a lateral that was recovered in the end zone for a touchdown by Louisville uh, for the game. Georgia Tech had a 410 to 326 yard edge and an uh, 18 to 14 first down edge really outplayed Louisville somehow didn't cover that game uh, losing by 12 and they were getting 10 and a half. So I wasn't blown away with Louisville last week. Notre Dame's the same team that two weeks ago pounded Purdue 66 to seven. Now they did lose a couple of offensive linemen, but they got those offensive linemen, the new guys feet wet against Miami of Ohio last week. And I think they'll be prepared here against Louisville. You're playing with legitimate revenge, a game where Notre Dame turned the ball over. They were minus four in turnovers last year against Louisville on the road and got pounded 33 to 20. Uh, I like the Irish to win this one by over a touchdown. 
Bill in the Big Ten, a crazy uh, thing happening here with Illinois starting out 4-0, number 19 in the country. Brett Bielema has got the Illini uh, to relevancy here and, and a chance to make a huge statement on the road against Penn State. The Nittany Lions have not really been challenged per se. I know that they they had the game at West Virginia and then they, they didn't play all that well against Bowling Green, but... Bowling Green, Kent State, not stiff competition. I don't know that we know a whole lot about this Penn State team, but we know that Illinois has been tested and they've been passing each test every week. Chances Illinois goes in here and stuns the world. You know, I think they have that opportunity. Uh, I'm going to go back to last year's game. Uh, last year when these two played, you know, watching the game, I thought it was a pretty even game. In fact, the uh, first downs were even at 20. Uh, the yards were practically even in the game. The difference was five turnovers by Illinois. And Luke Altmeyer at that time was a turnover machine. In fact, last year, Luke Altmeyer, 13 touchdown passes, 10 interceptions, and his worst game of the year was the Penn State game. Well, this year, Luke Altmeyer is a different quarterback. When I talked to Coach Bielema prior to the season, he told me how improved he was. How about 10 touchdown passes, zero interceptions? So I thought they played offensively and defensively, even with Penn State last year. You're not going to win very many games when you're minus five in turnovers. If Altmeyer can continue to play like he's been playing so far, not turn the ball over, I think Illinois can stay with Penn State. But this is a very tough Penn State team, one that's extremely good as a, a big underdog. In fact, in Big Ten play as a, I'm excuse me, as a favorite, I should say, in Big Ten play as a favorite, uh, Franklin's got a great record. It's against the big boys that he struggles. It's in Happy Valley. He's telling the crowd, hey, treat this like a whiteout. So it's going to be sort of like a whiteout, even though it's not an official whiteout game. And you guys know how tough that can be. Um, so I, I think I've got Penn State winning the game, but I think Illinois is going to give him a game. I, I, it's a good game. I wouldn't bet it because, like I said, Penn State's great favorite. Illinois has got that potential. I think it's going to be a fun game to watch. Of course, the marquee game of the week is in the SEC. You've got number two, Georgia, at number four, Alabama. A lot of pressure, it feels like, on Kalen DeBoer, the new head coach at Alabama. The Tide were impressive when last we saw them going on the road and winning handily in Wisconsin. Georgia's only been on the road once so far this year, and that was that disjointed effort that they barely survived at Kentucky. Uh, what do you see playing out in this tussle in Tuscaloosa, Phil? Yeah, uh, naturally, how do you play against either of these two teams? I mean, Georgia's got that long regular season losing streak or winning streak. Uh, they also are playing with legitimate revenge. That loss they had to Alabama in the SEC championship game kept them out of the playoff last year. And frankly, I feel if Georgia had made the playoff last year, they would have won it all. I thought they were the best team in college football. And with Alabama, I know they beat Wisconsin 42 to 10, but I wasn't blown away. And in fact, in the first half, I think with about um, a minute to go in the first half, the yards were 250 to 250. I mean, the yards were even. Uh, Bama then got a big play for a touchdown and used some big plays in the second half for the game. They only had an 18-17 first down edge. So they weren't quite as dominant as the final score would show against Wisconsin. However, uh, my computer loves Alabama here. It's got Alabama winning by, you know, like 12 points. And when I analyze the two teams, I think Georgia's got the better defense. They've got a deeper defense and a better defense. But offensively, I'm going to give the edge to Alabama. You look at the receiving core, Ryan Williams, Bernard Prentice. I haven't seen a Georgia wide receiver really emerge in the running game. I like Miller and Haynes. Uh, and, of course, Jalen Milrow gives you not only the exceptional passer, he's hitting 68%. Uh, with a 9-0 ratio this year, but he's also the dangerous runner. It gives you that extra dimension. So, and Alabama hasn't been a home dog since 2007. That was Nick Saban's first year. Uh, and uh, add it all up, I'm actually going to go with the Tide to win this one at home. Wow. I, I like that one. That's going to be a fun game to watch for sure. Uh, Illinois is the big surprise in the Big Ten. Meanwhile, BYU has been the surprise in the Big 12, starting out 4-0. Got in the top 25 this past week. And we talked about it here last week when BYU, uh, we preview BYU Kansas State. That was going to be a weird kind of game for Kansas State on the road, a tough challenge. And, and BYU took it and ran with it, winning 38 to 9 over Kansas State. Meanwhile, BYU, or excuse me, Baylor had a 24 to 10 lead early in the game against Colorado. They ended Ugh. up losing that game. Tough game for for Dave Aranda and company, but they feel like a more scrappy, toughy, a tougher team than they were a year ago. I don't know how to play this one, uh, 
Bill, what do you think here? Yeah, tough game for Phil Steele and company because I had Baylor <laughs> in that game. And uh, you had yeah. to feel pretty good. You're up by seven. You're getting points. You go for a game-winning field goal late in the game. You're going to be up by 10. No problem. It's a chip shot. And he misses, but no problem. And now Colorado's at midfield. It's the last play of the game. We got this. Hal Mary touchdown. And then in overtime, you fumble into the end zone as you're going in for the game. Tying touchdown. Oh, what a frustrating game for Baylor. But they are back at home. And the BYU game, if you watch that thing last week, it really wasn't a 38 to 9 game. In fact, the first 28 minutes, Kansas State was in complete control of that thing. Uh and you know, you go to the it's they settle for two field goals. They're only up 6 nothing and then boom, BYU scores like uh 31 points in a 5 minute span. The last 2 minutes of the first uh, half, the first 3 minutes of the second half, you were talking about a punt return touchdown, fumble return touchdown, two interceptions setting up short fields. Uh, for the game, Kansas State actually had a 367, 241-yard edge, uh, ran the ball for 228 yards. It was just a weird five minutes, and it really gave BYU control. But I will say this about BYU, and I said it last week, they have impressed me each and every week. Uh, I like the win at Smooth. They played well against Wyoming. But they are a little bit of a fake 4-0 team here, and I think Baylor's a team that could easily be 3-1 and right now. I'm going to take Baylor to bounce back and get this one at home. I think we got two misleading finals last week, and that's usually when I like to play on the team that didn't have the benefit last week. I like that. I think Baylor feels like a salty football team. Let's, let's go to Lawrence, Phil. TCU is heading to Kansas. Uh, you know, the old adage of don't let one game beat you twice. It almost feels like that's what played out with TCU. They blew that big lead against UCF at home, lost the game, and then felt like they didn't show up against rival SMU and had 66 points dropped on them. They can't run the football. That doesn't bode well for teams that travel. Meanwhile, Kansas is sitting there at one and three, but it's a pretty formidable football team for one and three. I mean, I don't think their record reflects what they're capable of. What do you see playing out with TCU visiting Kansas? Yeah, definitely more impressed with Kansas. I had Illinois over Kansas. I had UNLV over Kansas. I had West Virginia over Kansas. And each time I was sweating bullets in those games. I did come out with the the wins. But, uh, you know, even last week, Kansas had a two-score lead over West Virginia late in the game. And I was I was getting a little worried about that. Um <laughs> So, yes, Kansas has been playing better. They're tough at home. You know, TCU had one of those games last week as well. Early in the game, they give up a 51-yard fumble return for a touchdown. They gave up a 69-yard punt return for a touchdown. And there was another defensive score in the game, a 60-yard interception return for a touchdown. They actually had a yardage edge in the game, 480 to 375. Uh, but it's tough to overcome one defensive score, let alone two defensive scores, let alone three defensive scores. So the defense, not quite as bad as the 66 points. Uh, they gave up 21 points when the defense wasn't even on the field last week. But I, I think looking at the two teams, it does seem like TCU's in a little bit of a funk. Uh, they gave up that late game against UCF, as you mentioned. And uh, I'm going to lean a little bit with Kansas at home. I, I think it's going to be a fun game to watch, though. Bill, Colorado goes to Orlando in the weird matchup again here of the Big 12 going coast to coast here uh, as they take on UCF, who is 3-0. and Again, I, Phil, I, I just don't get it with this Knights team. I, I think they're good. I think they're talented. But I had to do a double take when I saw the spread for this week's game against Colorado. It's, it's a two-touchdown uh, spread at last I looked. Colorado's been more tested. UCF has has played two or has only played one FBS opponent so far, and that was TCU, who they came back and won against. I don't think Colorado wins the game, but it seems like UCF's laying a ton of points here. Am I wrong? Uh, I am. I do like UCF in this game. Uh, okay. For for I think it's a tremendous situation. You're talking about a Colorado team that's playing its fifth game in five weeks. They're coming off a massive overtime win. Uh, there had to be a huge celebration because they, for all intents and purposes, they had that game lost. Remember, they went on the road and got dominated by Nebraska, much worse than the final score would indicate. That yeah. thing was 28 nothing at the half. They came back to 28 tenths. I'm still not wild about Colorado at the line of scrimmage. Either offensive line or defensive line last week again ran the ball uh, for just 91 yards, 2.2 yards per carry. And while they're probably at the end of the tank here, uh, 
you know, running out of gas. UCF's fresh off a bye at home in Bright House. And Malzahn has really built this team. I mean, he brought in a ton of transfers uh, defensively, offensively. They showed me a lot when they came back and beat TCU on the road. That was a really good victory. They've got a deep backfield with Harvey and Boone and Montgomery. Even K.J. Jefferson can run. I'd like to see K.J. be a little more productive, but I thought he showed something against TCU. Uh, when he threw for 230 yards. And I, I just love the situation for UCF, the fact that they're off a bye, fresh, at home, rested. And meanwhile, Colorado's playing on a fifth straight week off a huge overtime win. I'm going to go with UCF minus the points in this one. You got the unbeaten and 18th ranked Iowa State Cyclones heading to Houston. This is a battle of the number one ranked defense in the conference in the Clones, uh, the worst offense in the conference in Houston, Rocco Beck for Iowa State playing efficient football. Uh, John Haycock is just dialing it up again as a defensive wizard, as he always does. Is this one of those – is this why they play the games type situation where Houston might be able to work some surprises, or is it the foregone conclusion that it seems with this offense against this Iowa State defense? You know, I do like the way Houston played at Oklahoma. I thought they played a good game there. Uh, they actually had the yardage edge in that game. But the two games that really stand out to me are the UNLV game, where they should have been shut out. I mean, they were totally dominated by UNLV, both sides of the ball. I think they scored a touchdown in the final minute of that game to avoid the shutout. And then last week, I had Cincinnati as one of my top plays. And I worry about games when I'm watching them. But I tell you what, in the third quarter, wasn't even worried the rest of the game. They only had 12 first downs, 222 yards. And that's a Cincinnati defense that had been giving up over 400 yards per game coming in. Now they're taking on Iowa State, and it would not surprise me, guys, if Iowa State's in the Big 12 title game this year. When I went over the team with Coach Campbell, uh, oh, it seemed like every position wrap-up. Coach, how do you feel about the position overall? You know, after we went through every player, he'd be like, Phil, this is the deepest. This is the best since I've been here. And he's been there quite some time. And they usually don't play well as a big favorite. So I was concerned a little bit about the Arkansas State game last week because they were a three-touchdown favorite. Well, guess what? They started strong. The middle played strong, and they finished the game strong. They won 52-7, to seven, a very impressive game. I like what they do offensively, and the defense, as you mentioned, is outstanding. So I, I can see a shutout here. They're laying less than two touchdowns on the road. And this is an Iowa State team that, like I said, don't be surprised if they're in the Big 12 title game at the end of the year. A couple of 3-1 and one teams of Cincinnati goes to Lubbock to take on Texas Tech. Uh, Cincinnati could very easily be 4-0 if they don't blow uh, that, that three-touchdown lead against the Pitt Panthers. Um, Texas Tech seeming like they're starting to get back on track after kind of a weird, wacky start to their year against Abilene Christian. They lose big up on the road at Washington State. Feels like a big opportunity here for one of these two teams to put their foot in the ground and, and, and maybe gain some momentum here in the Big 12 early on in the year. What do you see happening here in Lubbock? Yeah, and I think Cincinnati is the stronger team, uh, both sides of the ball. Uh, I like the way Swarsby's playing. He has not thrown an interception all year. He's got an 8-0 ratio, hitting 65%. Corey Kiner, a dynamic running back. And in that game against Washington State, the Texas Tech loss, they did not have Taj Brooks. Brooks is back. He's got 378 yards in just three games. So I think since he's a better team, but that's a, a strange environment there in uh, Lubbock. And, uh, you know, Texas Tech is always tough at home. And as you mentioned, they're playing better. The North Texas game – I watched the first quarter, and that thing was pretty close. And then the next thing, I'm watching my 12 games. I look up, and it's like, what, what? How'd they get 52 <laughs> points? So they just, uh, you know, there's a couple of key interceptions there that help. But, uh, you know, it's. I think it's going to be a fun game to watch. I think Cincinnati's a better team. Texas Tech's tough to play on, uh, play against uh, at home. Uh, should be a great game to watch. On game and the Little Apple, you have number 20, Oklahoma State, against number 23, Kansas State. Now, what I think of here, Phil, is a year ago when Kansas State visited Stillwater and everybody was ready to write the Cowboys off. You didn't. And you told us not so fast, my friend. And you kind of said, watch out for what Oklahoma State might do in this game against Kansas State. Sure enough, they pulled the upset. This situation this year, a little different. A battle of two, three, and one teams coming off their first loss. Kansas State was demolished on the road against BYU. Oklahoma State didn't survive Utah. Whoever falls short in this one's going to have two in the loss column. Makes things a little difficult, but a lot of football left to play. Interesting matchup. 
five point line favoring Kansas State. What do you see playing out here in Manhattan? Yeah, and in this one, I like the Wildcats this year. Uh, you know, they're playing with legitimate revenge. They're at home. They play a lot better at home. Remember the Arizona game, uh, close at the half, and then Kansas State put its foot down the second half. And the one thing with the uh, defense is, remember, you go back to Oklahoma State last year against UCF. Uh, UCF just shut down Ollie Gordon, and just they blew out Oklahoma State. It seems like teams are just shutting down Ollie Gordon this year, and Alan Bowman hasn't been able to compensate. Now, Bowman's got good numbers. He's hitting 64% with 11-4 ratio. But remember last week at the half, he was benched against Utah, and they actually trailed that game 22-3. to uh, Bowman did come back off the bench. Wrangell had been in there, I think, three or four series. Bowman comes off the bench, leads a couple of touchdowns late to make it 22-19. But still, even with those late touchdowns, they were still outgained by 171 yards. I talked about Kansas State, the BYU game, how they were in control. All of a sudden, a ridiculous five minutes of turnovers and, and special teams, and they ended up at, at that blowout loss. But now they're back at home. I've been more impressed with Kansas State this year, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to side with Kansas State minus the points at home in this one. And Phil, obviously no West Virginia game this week, but did want to get your thoughts on that game last week. They, they're trailing by 11. You kind of have that doomsday type feeling where you're you're on the brink of maybe going one and three. They find a way to bounce back, finish the game strong, and, and get the win going to the bye week two and two. What's your, your overall evaluation of the Mountaineers through the first four games, and, and what do you see coming out of the bye week for this this team that's got three ranked opponents waiting for them? Yeah, I, I'm still – I like what, what I see out of West Virginia. I love the run game. Uh, Donaldson and Green and White, they get, they've got a very effective run game. Uh, the defense, you know, the pass defense is probably my biggest concern and one of the reasons I liked them against Kansas. I didn't think Kansas would exploit that last week. Uh, as mentioned, they've got Oklahoma State coming up. I'm not too worried about that pass defense. Uh, and they've got some games at home. So I think I think West Virginia is going to come out of this pretty good. Do keep in mind, they played Penn State, which is undefeated. They played Pitt, which is undefeated. And they played a Kansas team that uh, has been, as, as mentioned, uh, not they're one and three, but they're playing pretty good football. So they've had a pretty tough schedule so far. Awesome, Phil. Well, thank you so much once again for joining us. Even on the bye week, we bring Phil back, and we'll have him back next week as well to break down some games, including West Virginia and Oklahoma State. Phil, thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. Yeah, a lot of fun as always, guys. You have a great weekend. Have a great bye week. What are you guys yeah. going to do on your bye week? <laughs> Sit back and autumn relax. <laughs> yeah, we got a big autumn festival up here in the mountains right here in my hometown. So usually I'm working. But this weekend, I'm not. So the wife's nice. taking me to that. Where I'm a, taking nice. her. a stress-free weekend in West Virginia. So uh, we'll have um, Phil again next week to break down West Virginia, Oklahoma State. Stay tuned. When we come back, we'll make our Big 12 picks for us and then Owen and Wes as well. There are better-known tractors in the world than Coyote. Ones with bigger names, longer histories, more popular hats, cute toy lines. But there's not a single tractor ever been built that's better equipped to do the dirty work. So we'll just focus on what really matters. Coyote, we dig dirt. Now at Johnston Equipment, get 0% financing for 72 months, plus a free loader on select Coyote models in stock. Visit us on Route 33 between Weston and Buchanan. Back in the gun, we're going to go ahead and make our weekly pick here on the show of ITG. Make sure that you put in your picks as well to try and beat me, Jed, Wes, and Owen as we pick the best offense, defense, the best passing team, the best rushing team every week. Uh, we'll have that link, I believe, pinned to our Twitter account or X account at In the Gun. And uh, before we get into recapping how we did last week and then also getting into our picks this week, another thank you to Johnston Equipment, the newest friends of our show. Get 0% financing for up to 84 months with approved credit on select Coyote 72. tractors. 72 months. 72 months. Yeah. There we go. Uh, on select Coyote tractors in stock now at Johnston Equipment, Route 33 between Weston and Buchanan. So, Jed, I won two weeks in a row. I was able to block you guys, and now I believe the tables have turned. So go ahead and recap how we all did last week. Uh, if you want to leave mine out, that's fine. Okay. Passing, rushing, defense, and offense. All right, start with passing. Last week, to throw for the most yards in the Big 12, I picked TCU. 
They did, in fact, throw for the most yards in the Big 12. They threw for 415 yards in that 66-42 loss to SMU that you heard Phil talking about. So they were number one in the conference. I am awarded five points. Owen, to rush for the most yards in the Big 12, he picked West Virginia. The Mountaineers came through, but the ground game did not. So West Virginia actually ended up finishing number seven in the Big 12. Uh, Utah led the way with 249, Kansas with 247, Iowa State 237, Kansas State 228. West Virginia at number seven was worth no points for Owen. West defensively, again, last week you blocked West from picking Iowa State, yeah, which he was going to do. So instead of picking Iowa State, he picked Cincinnati versus Houston, and he ends up winning. So the block worked in his favor. He ends up winning because Cincinnati pitches a 34-0 shutout over Houston. So they allow the fewest points in the mm. conference, and Wes is awarded the full five points. To score the most points in the conference, you picked Texas Tech versus Arizona State. No respect for those fighting Dillinghams, man. Come on, <laughs> you know. Uh, they actually finished eighth in scoring in the Big 12. Iowa State led the way with 52 you were awarded a zero points. So that's how that shook out. And then let's quickly take a look at some of the fan votes and some of the things that they got right. Uh, okay. Scoring offense. Uh, let's see. We had Denny from Ona, West Virginia did in fact pick Iowa state. And so he got that one, right? Okay, I'm trying to see if anybody picked Cincinnati. They did not. Uh, okay, I'm trying to see if anybody picked Utah. They did not for the rushing offense. Uh, okay, and then TCU was picked by Philip in Germany for the passing wow. offense. So good on you, Philip in Germany. So that's from a viewer standpoint, those that got those right. This is tough. Yes, this is, it is. I mean, 16 I got, teams last week, 15 of them played. It's tough uh, to place in the top five even. Like I told you before we started recording, I, I can barely hit the one maybe every four weeks for those to get multiple. Hats off to you because uh, I don't know how Absolutely. you do it. If you Impressive. do know, if you do, if you are one of those ones that gets multiple right, go ahead and, and give us some of your picks so we can try and cash in on them. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and get into our picks this week. So uh, who wants who, who are we going to start with here first? We have their picks, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, go ahead and give their picks. So Wes is going to go with the Iowa State defense, and Iowa State will be taking on the mighty Houston Cougars who have really struggled uh, offensively this year, um, to, to say the least. And uh, Owen was going to go Utah, but then he had a change of heart because he's got a soft spot for Devin Neal and the Kansas Jayhawks. So he is once again for the probably the the 900th straight week going to go with the Kansas Jayhawks as they take on TCU. So, um, yeah. So here's what we'll do. Uh, since Wes and I both won last week, we both get to block someone, and we both chose to block Skyler. Now – I'm looking at this, Kyler. I almost wish I would have blocked West from taking Iowa State, but yeah. Oh, I didn't. So West blocked you from a scoring offense standpoint from taking UCF, and I doubled down and blocked you from taking Texas Tech. So who is your tertiary option to score uh, the, uh, yeah, the most points? Yeah, y'all really screwed me this week. I'll say that because I that would have been one of my two picks for sure. There's really not anything else that I love. So I'm kind of just winging it this week. I'm going to – I feel like something's going to happen in this TCU-Kansas game. Someone's going to score a lot of points, so I'm just flipping a coin and hoping it lands with the right pick here. I'll go TCU. I think Kansas is in this, this spot where they're one and three. They're kind of finding – trying to search for answers. Maybe they lost a little bit of confidence once again. They just keep falling on the wrong side of these one-score games. And TCU, even though that they just got beat by SMU in a, in a rivalry game, they're putting up points every week. They scored 42 last week. They scored 34 at Stanford. They scored 34 against UCF. 
I don't know if this is going to get into the forties or whatnot, but there's a lot of rock fights that I see in, in this, this, uh, the rest of these games. And obviously I can't pick UCF. So I'll go with TCU slinging it around with Josh Hoover, um, who I'm going to really need to come through because they're not a team that likes to run the ball a whole lot right now. So hopefully Hoover comes up big for me. I'll go with the frogs. Frogs it is. Now for the passing offense, I almost went TCU as well, Skyler. I considered that. I took a look also at Texas Tech. Uh, again, the nature of these games, I want somebody who's going to be trailing for a lot of the game. So yeah. they keep chucking it and keep throwing. I'm not so sure that will be the case with the Texas Tech game at home against Cincinnati. I'm not confident enough. Maybe it will. But I do think Colorado on the road as a 14 and a half point underdog to UCF will be trailing most of that football game. And I think they'll have to continue to throw the football and throw the football. Which so, is right up their alley. Of, yeah, that's right. A bunch of hollow carbs as they stack up <laughs> meaningless yards, I hope. So uh, once again, I'm going to go with Colorado to throw for the most yards. That's my in vogue pick so far. Um, I'm going to go with Colorado at UCF to throw for the most yards in the Big 12. That's my pick for the week. Well, there you go. And make sure you can you can participate in these picks like we said in the opening of this segment. Uh just go to our X account at in the gun and it'll have the the form there. You can go and pick your make your picks this week and every week to try and beat us. And uh do we have do we have standings? Do we have updated standings for us or do we are we gotta get that updated? We have to get that updated. I, Usually I'll, I'm so think, miserable and so far behind that I don't yeah. want to see it, but now I'm kind of interested. <laughs> You know. we'll, we'll just, for the sake of, of saying it, we'll just say that I'm in first because I did win two weeks in a row. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm probably, I probably did tumble a little bit last week. So I think we're actually all pretty even um, because we've all had our fair share of love here in the first few weeks of the like year. Like we have more first place winners this year. Yeah. It took us it what, like five or six weeks, I think, last year till we finally I mean, got You have a couple. I have a couple. Wes has at least one. I think Owen's uh, got Owen one. had one, right? I so, think so. Yeah. Yeah. Owen had one. So Some healthy yeah, competition. I, I think, yeah, it's a hell. I mean, we're we're hitting more of these first place this year, but a couple of interesting numbers we'll leave folks with is a lot of fun things happen. When we talk to Phil off the air, right? Um, but it, it struck us that okay, one number on TCU and one number on West Virginia. TCU has now lost ten of their last seventeen games. <laughs> that that's, that's kind of that's kind of crazy when you think of since beating Michigan in the semifinal. They've lost 10 of their last 17 games. That's that's just weird to contemplate. And West Virginia, meanwhile, has now won eight of their last 11 Big 12 conference games. We're eight and three in our last 11, dating back to the end of the year before last. So two interesting numbers to, to chew on during the bye week that we'll leave you with there. Kind yeah. Of, kind of cool. Absolutely. And even though West Virginia's got three ranked opponents coming out of the gate, the first one, Oklahoma State's a tough one. It's a tough venue to play in. But Oklahoma State's going through the ringer right now. They just played Utah in a very tough physical game. They've got Kansas State in another tough, very physical game. And I don't know what their quarterback situation is going to be because Alan Bowman didn't look great against Utah, and I believe they even at one point brought in their backup in that yeah, game. So, serious. Yeah, so who knows what that's going to look like for them uh, when, when they square off against West Virginia or even this week against Kansas State. So, And also, always- Skyler, all three of those won't be ranked. Exactly. In other words, whatever plays out with Kansas State and Oklahoma State, they're both out. barely ranked. They're in the 20s. So one of them's likely to fall out, whoever the loser of that game is. Now, whether, let's say, Kansas State loses, can they rebound in time before they come to Morgantown to once again be ranked? I don't know. But if Oklahoma State loses, yeah, we're probably not going to be playing in Oklahoma, a ranked Oklahoma State team in Stillwater next week. But if they win, we absolutely will be. Yeah. Tough a uh, little stretch coming out of the break here, but it's a good time for for everyone involved, players, coaches, us, to take a, a step back and breathe a little bit uh, before we get into this thing. Once again, there is another bye week coming up, uh, I believe, in the early part of November. So a uh, little stretch here before another break, but that'll do it for this week's episodes of ITG. The one thing we ask of you is to be an ear and tell an ear about your new favorite WB football podcast, In the Gun. For Owen Schmidt, Wes Euler, Jed Drenning, I'm Scott Callen. Thank you guys for watching. We'll be back next week for a brand new episode as we start diving into West Virginia and Oklahoma State. You've been in the gun. I-T-G.
the fun doesn't have to stop here. Be sure to hit subscribe and never miss an episode. If you have any questions, suggestions, or feedback, be sure to follow us on X at In The Gun Podcast. Join us again next time. Until then. Tell an ear to tell an ear about your new favorite WVU football podcast. This mission is over. It's over.